Thank you, thank you, and you may be seated. What a pleasure it is to be here tonight, and I enjoyed the worship. It was just wonderful. I love those songs. That's some of my favorites, and to see all of you here on a midweek service. Pastor, this is a good crowd. <laughs> no, they're here. <laughs> and I thank you very much for the invitation to be with you, and I have really look forward to it. Uh, a lot of you don't know that I have connections back to Manny many, many years ago. And, and before I was very old and my mother and father were in this part of the country. And uh, this, was, this has been a great church for a long time. And I am so thankful to see it doing well. And aren't you glad you've got this wonderful pastor and his wife? <laughs> Somehow or other, I just think the Mannings belong in Manny. <laughs> Don't that seem right to you? And uh, he, a pastor has already mentioned my husband. My husband was so delighted to have this couple move into our district and to come take this church and lead it on to new days and greater things. And God has certainly been faithful and has certainly blessed you. And I don't blame you for clapping. These folks are outstanding. They are wonderful. And I have a friend that drove me here tonight, Brother Joe, and he was talking about what a great preacher your pastor is. He has heard him numerous times in other places. So, you know, it's nice to belong to people that other people respect, isn't it? And then Miss Angie. Nobody like Miss Angie. She is dear to me. I mean that. She is very special. When she walked into my life, my, my, my love just went crazy. I don't even know why, except as I got to know her, I saw what a wonderful person she was. But I love Angie Manning, and she is a great woman. And she is a soul winner. How many of you have had, have had a personal touch from your pastor's wife? She cares for people. She loves people. And uh, thank you for the invitation to be here, Pastor. And this is going to be a little different. And I'm going to introduce it by talking about one of my great-grandchildren. Is that Okay. I have a little grandson, great-grandson, named Sam. And Sam, his family have been staying with me. They've been having repairs on their house, and they've been staying with me, which means when I say they, it's a mama and a daddy and four little boys. My house has been busy, and it has been anything but quiet. But I have enjoyed it immensely. And Sam has... Uh, moved into my bed. He has become my sleeping partner. And he, uh, he, he outnumbered the other boys with his vocal uh, assertion that he was going to sleep with Mimi. And so he has been sleeping with me. And every night we get in bed and he says, Mimi, tell me them stories again. Tell me them stories again. Tell me when you were little. Tell me what Christmas was like when you were little. And we have stories and stories and more stories. And I'm about to run out of stories. But, but uh, he doesn't care if I repeat them. So I have come here tonight for a very special kind of message. It's going to be different. And the title of it is Stories to Tell Your Children. And I think it's very appropriate for holiday time. Because that's family time. And you gather around and grandma and grandpa come in and they tell stories and you, you love to hear them and you tell stories to your children. And so tonight we're having stories to tell your children. And it's very appropriate for me to be the one to tell them. Because in two weeks I'll be 85 years old. And I'm proud of every day. Because I'm a survivor. I've made it. Now, y'all look at me and know you can make it. You can make it. So I want to share some things with you. And 
let me just say that there is a very scriptural reason for doing this. In Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, and the 7th, 7th verse, it says, You remember to tell your children. And not only that place, but many places in the Bible, we find the word remember. God says to the children of Israel, his people, very often he says, you remember when I did this. You remember when you were slaves in Egypt and I delivered you. You remember when you were thirsty for water in the desert and water came out of the rock. You remember when. So we're in good territory to stop long enough to remember. There's another reason for it. The late 80s, 90s, early 90s, I worked in the country of Bulgaria for several months. Bulgaria was one of the earliest uh, of those Eastern European countries that got out from under the bondage of communism. And uh, they, they were wide open for the gospel. And actually, I was invited to go with a, a friend of mine that worked in the White House. And she had been invited to speak to a group of business women on Christian principles. And she called me and she said, if you'll go with me, I'll go. But I don't want to go without somebody I really can fall back on to help with this. And we had a great meeting. But as a result of that meeting, I had an educator that came to meet me and she begged me to come back and to do some things. And she said to me, she said, you know, Mrs. Tenney, we have a generation of over 50 to 60, 70 years that have never seen a Bible. They have never been to church. I always thought it was because they was against the law to, t to go to church, but she said, that's not it. The thing of it is, if you go to church and take your children to church, now the old people could go to church, but if you took your children to church, then they could not go to school and they certainly could never go to college. So it was a pretty good way to handle the situation. I was there for Christmas, and they were starting to sing Christmas carols for the first time in over 50 years. They had not even heard a Christmas carol. Now, what the reason I, I mentioned Bulgaria is this is what happened. In the 1600s, the Bulgarian people translated the Bible into the Slovak languages. And they were a very Christianized country. Not only that, but even as late as the 1900s, they had a tremendous Pentecostal revival. And then communism swept in and literally destroyed the whole foundation of that nation. And the first thing that communism does or did is they rewrite the history and they take out everything that pertains to Christianity and to God. Fast forward to the early 90s when I was on the, the state school board, the Bessie board, and I had a granddaughter that was in the second grade I went by their house to visit them and she had brought a paper home from school. And the paper showed an Indian and a pilgrim and they were getting ready for Thanksgiving dinner. But this was what the caption said. Thanksgiving, a time when the pilgrims thanked the Indians for helping them with their crops. Now that's not what I read in history books that the first Thanksgiving was when people realized that God had helped them survive. They came here for religious freedom and they thanked God. And when I saw that, I went back to the state board and demanded that those things be corrected. Now, I feel very sure that after I was gone, they probably went back. But I'm telling you that to tell you this. Stories from your past are important. They become anchors. And if we do away with our past, it will totally change our future. So for that reason, 
How many of you have had an, uh, an experience, a spiritual experience with the Holy Spirit in the last three years? Raise your hand. I know there are many. I knew there were a lot of what we call first generation Pentecostals. How many of you here have had the Holy Ghost for 50 years? Anybody? Me. <laughs> yes, there's some. We have a whole crop of new people. And I don't know whether you know the history of what you're in, but it's a great history. And the same God that did the wonderful miracles of the Old Testament and the New Testament is your God. And he is still doing miracles. And for that reason, we're going to go back just like the scripture said and say, remember when. And I have stories to tell you that you would be blessed to know and I don't want you to ever forget them. Now I'm giving you an assignment too. When you go home tonight or sometime in the next two days, I want you to read Psalms 78. Everybody say 78. 78. Psalm 78. Because it is a review of the tremendous miracles that happened that God kept reminding his people to not forget. See, miracles continue if we repeat the things that brought them in the first place. And those are the things I want to talk to you about tonight. I'm going to start off by telling you one of my stories. Tom and I, my husband, uh, were, were young. Well, believe it or not, we were young one time. And we'd only been married a very short time. We were pastor in a very small little church. And it was time to go to General Conference. And General Conference was such an important thing to us. And we wanted to go. But we didn't have any money. And uh, so a lady in the church said, if you'll let me go with you, I'll pay for half the gas. Well, that sounded good. And we, we mustered up the rest of it and went to conference. Now, we got there, checked in our hotel. It was a minus three-star hotel. <laughs> and the bed was more akin to a hammock down a bed but we were just happy to be there we had a great conference enjoyed it and the last day Tom came in and he said well I have news for you we have enough money to buy gas and have one hamburger and a drink on a 1200 mile trip and I said well that's good enough for me and we made it didn't starve to death and we got home and he also told me, he said, we have a visiting preacher that's coming for Sunday night. And uh, I thought, well, that means I need to feed the preacher and I have to decide what I'm going to do. So I said to him, I said, well, do you have any money? We'd been gone a week. We didn't have anything in the kitchen, you know. And he said, I don't have any money. So as smart as I was, I did what all smart women do. I went to the closet and got down all my purses because every woman knows that money hides in purses. <laughs> I went through every one of those purses and I didn't see any money. The day wore on and I didn't know what I was going to do because I, all I wanted was enough money to buy some mush, mushroom soup and a loaf of bread because somebody had served me mushroom soup over toast and I thought that looked pretty classy. So I wanted to serve the preacher mushroom soup over toast, but I didn't have any money. So late that evening, I went back to the closet, got down the same purses, and started going through them. And you can believe it or not, but I am here to tell you I do not lie. There was a $10 bill in one of those purses. Somebody said, but it must have been counterfeit. Well, counterfeit or not, it's spent. <laughs> I don't know where the money came from, but I am here to tell you it happened to me. I saw it. I felt it. I spent it. But if God can put money in a fish's mouth, That's right. That's right. God can put money in a purse right. when you're desperate for it. And God can still provide. 
he still can provide, and I thank God for it. And then another one, you know, God has always promised to provide for us. Terry and Steve, that's my daughter and her husband, they first were married and evangelizing, and they had a little tiny motor home. And they started to the Northwest, and they got out there and ran out of money. Now, you know, she's 61 now. So when she first got married, that was a long time before cell phones and other ways of communication. And they didn't have enough money to buy gas. And back then, you didn't even use credit cards a lot. And so they pulled up on a parking lot somewhere out in the Northwest. And Steve got out and went in the store. I don't know why, because he didn't have any money, but he did. And while Terry was in the motorhome, there was a knock at her door. She opened the door and there stood a strange woman. And the woman said, I see you have Mississippi license on your trailer and I would like to know where you're from. I'm from Mississippi. So Terry invited her in and they visited a little while. In a few minutes, the lady left. But it was just a few minutes later and there was another knock on the door. Terry opened the door and the same lady. She said, I have no idea why I'm doing this. But when I left, I felt like I had to come back and give you some money. Here's $25. God has promised to provide. And when you are in desperate need, he will always take care of you if you have been faithful to him. Those are miracles that have happened in my family, things that I know about myself. Another one. Y'all like stories? Yes. My mom and dad, my dad was always starting new churches. And this was, uh, it, this was a long time ago. There was no church in Monroe. And my dad decided he wanted to start a church there. So he moved us over to Monroe. He bought an old house and remodeled it a little bit for us to live in. And it got tough because, you know, starting a brand new church was not easy. And I overheard, I was in my early teens then, and I overheard one Saturday afternoon, I heard my mother say to my dad, E.W., do you have some money? I don't have anything for Sunday dinner. Well, you certainly didn't go out to eat in those days. And being a hungry teenager, that worried me because she had nothing for dinner on Sunday. So dad rounded us up and he said, well, let's go do our visitation. We always went to visit people on Saturday afternoon, try to get them to come to church Sunday morning. When we came home, sitting on the front steps, front porch of our little house were some big brown grocery sacks. In them was a, a roast, vegetables, rolls, and even a cake a complete Sunday dinner, and it had been delivered by the local drunk. If God can use a raven, an unclean bird, to feed a prophet, he can use a drunk to feed a preacher. And he did it, and he can still do those great miracles. How many of you, well, let me tell you another one about a man by the name of Brother Foss. Now, you folks would know that name, but not, not many of your congregation. But he was an old preacher that had a lot of influence on determining the spirit-led uh, church groups that we have nowadays. And they were, this was even back before my time. And they had been without food for five days. Nothing but bread and water. And he said, I'm going to the store. His wife said, why are you going to the store? You don't have any money. He said, I just feel like, I'm, I feel like that's what I'm supposed to do. So he starts walking to the store. He crosses a railroad track. And there among the gravels is a silver dollar. And a silver dollar in those days can buy a sack full of groceries. I don't know where these things come from. I don't know if God invented it. I don't know if he had somebody drop it. All I know is it was there when somebody needed it. 
and he promised to supply our needs, and he does, and he will. And stories to tell your children. I know Brother False. I knew him well, and I knew this, heard him tell this story many times myself. How many have ever been to the campground in Tioga? Well, this next story is one of my favorites, and it's, uh, it happened in the area where the campground is. It was in the 30s, and it was in the days of early revivals when we didn't have a lot of churches, but they would start revivals, tent revivals, and then a church would spring up. There was two past, two preachers, one named Brother Willie Holland and one named Brother Hemphill, and they were traveling from town to town preaching revivals and starting churches. They had a, an old flat bed, bed truck, and they had built a a little room on top of that flat bed and they had a bed in there and that's where they stayed. That's all they had to stay in. They too had been without food except for bread and water for several days. And they pulled up on the area, right in the area where the Tioga campground is, is where this happened. And Brother Hemphill says to Brother Holland, let's pray for steak tonight which was a real stretch when you'd have nothing but bread and water. So they got down, knelt down on the ground, and they prayed, and they asked God for steak. When they finished praying, they looked up. Now, you're not going to believe this, except you know I don't lie. They looked up, and coming across the field was a German shepherd dog with a package in his mouth. He ran straight to where they were, dropped the package, and ran off. They picked up the package, and it did not even have fang marks in it. Opened it up, and what do you think was in it? Steak. They had steak that night in answer to a prayer. I don't know where it came from. All I know is it happened. And I thank God that we serve a God who can take care of big things and he can take care of little things. And he is a God of the miraculous. Now let's get away from the provision a little bit for protection and how God takes care of us. The year was 1917. You see, we have all these things recorded by people that told us these things that lived through them. 1917, there was a camp meeting in Province Hall. Anybody here know where Provencal is? Not far from here, is it? And there was a man preaching by the name of W.A.M. Monk. While he was preaching, the service had gone on a long time. And in those days, you made a pallet under the, pe under the, the bench in front of you. It wasn't anything such as pews. They were benches. And, and all, all of us little kids slept on those pallets under the benches. There was a little girl asleep under one of the benches. Her mother and father sitting there, you know, in front of where she was. They looked down just in time to see a moccasin because it was an outdoor meeting. And a moccasin was crawling and crawled up the little girl's dress and out the collar. And about that time they screamed and the pastor, or the preacher heard what was going on he rebuked the situation, and the snake disappeared while they were watching. Y'all believe me? Can you say, thank God? Can you say, praise God? Thank God we serve a miracle God, and there is nothing too hard for him. Stories to tell your children, and they really happen. Anybody here remember Brother and Sister Weeks? Superintendent for many, many years, just before my husband became superintendent. And this year was 1935, and it happened in the town of Urania. You see, I'm not telling you far-fetched things. I'm telling you things that happened to people I know, people I talk to in towns that you have been in. <clears throat> it was in Urania. They were preaching a revival. And that afternoon, there was a terrible storm came up. Brother Weeks was sitting in one room, and Sister Weeks was in the other room. And while he was sitting there, it was a terrible bolt of lightning, and he saw it dance across the floor, and it went into the room where 
where his wife was, where Sister Weeks was. He got up and ran in there to find her laying prostrate on the floor with her clothes burned, her shoes had exploded and were off of her feet. And then when they checked later, the bobby pins in her hair were melted. And she was laying there totally lifeless. He fell on his knees, laid hands on her, prayed for her, and she got up totally unharmed. These things really happen, folks. They are recorded, and you need to know them. Because if you don't know the stories from the past, you won't believe God for what he has for now and the future. And you're still serving the same God. It is the same Holy Spirit that dwelt in them, and it dwells in us today. And I thank God for it. We have a, in the archives there on the campground, we have recordings from Brother Hester where there were many dead raised. Raised from the dead. It happened in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it happened in the New Testament, and it happens in modern days. People can be raised from the dead. They had a camp meeting in De Quincey. Anybody know where De Quincey is? had a camp meeting in De Quincey where they had many people witness that as the preachers were preaching, they saw angels on the platform. That happened not long ago at POA. It just so happened that my grandson was preaching and one of his little boys, Zach, was sitting there playing. All of a sudden he got up and he looked up to the platform and he said, Mama, who is that man behind Daddy preaching? Children often can see angels when adults cannot. I believe with all my heart because the angels of the Lord encamp around those that love him. Angels are real. Angels are here. Angels are given to you to be ministering spirits to you. Why shouldn't they be seen occasionally? They can be seen or they can be not seen. But anyway, at this camp meeting, they had many, many sightings of angels. And one night, there was a report came to them that there were balls of fire dancing across the top of the place where they were having the camp meeting. Now, fast forward to 1989, and we had a huge Holy Ghost rally at the campground in the tabernacle. There was a young couple from Cushata that she got kind of sick and they decided to leave early. They were driving around on the bypass on, on the other side of the tabernacle when he stopped very suddenly and she said, what's wrong? He said, the tabernacle's on fire. And they got out of their car and watched as flames of fire went across the top of the tabernacle. Over 100 people received the Holy Ghost that night. My husband was in missions work for many years, and in India they had what they they built what they called a pondal, which was kind of like a brush arbor, and uh, they were having revival services in this village, and the people had been very angry with them. They they were not happy that they were introducing a new religion into their their territory, and then all of a sudden one night, the tent or the little pondal was surrounded by people. It, it was scary for them, and they went out and said, what's wrong, what, what, why are you here? They said, we don't know what happened, but we heard this great, this great noise, and we ran to our doors to look out, and there was fire all across, and we thought you were all burning, and it was burning up. But the Holy Ghost came in Acts chapter two with tongues of fire, and the people saw them, and God still can do those same things. Stories to tell your children. You serve a miraculous God, and if you don't know about the miracles, you may never believe for a miracle. And then stories of the miracles of healings. There was, this happened in Brother Yoakum's revival. I knew Brother Yoakum, and he recorded it for us. 
He said there was a man in this, in, in this church that had one leg that was shorter than the other. They had a great move of God one night, and the man was dancing with that one leg shorter than the other. And a great spirit of praise and rejoicing and dancing came over the man, only to discover when he finished, what do you think? His other leg was exactly as his good leg. <laughs> Happened while he was dancing and worshiping before the Lord. This was in the 1960s. When the, if you've got, been to the campground, you know what we call the prayer chapel, the little building there? Well, that was first built for me to teach children's church in. And I would teach children's church there in the mornings. And then my husband and I would do youth services in the afternoon. Brother Barnes was with us. Anybody know Brother Barnes or heard of Brother Barnes, a great prophet of God that lived here in Louisiana? He was with us to speak to the young people that afternoon. And there was a girl on the front row who had one leg considerably shorter than the other one. At the end of that service, Brother Barnes walked over and just laid hands on her, never raised his voice, and suddenly we all were there to witness it. The girl's leg was lengthened just like the other one, just by a simple prayer. But now let me introduce you to another thought. Brother Barnes had a granddaughter who was born with a crippled leg and she had many surgeries, but she was never healed. And you must understand this about miracles. God does miracles on his own time. And just because somebody else got one doesn't mean you're gonna get a repeat of that. But I want you to know that God is able to do anything that we ask or think that we need him to do. But these are the miracles that I happen to know about myself. And then I like to go back to this one. We had a lady in our district many years ago. She was a tiny little thing and she was cute as she could be. This happened in, I believe it was 1912 because my husband had her record all these things on tape so we would have an actual testimony from her. She was a young woman and she was a preacher and she was quite a fiery little preacher. She had many miracles in her life. She was just so cute. She preached on a street corner one time when they were having street services. We used to do that. Anybody here ever been at a street service? I have. Well, she was preaching, and all of a sudden, she started speaking in what she thought was tongues, which was tongues, but there was a little difference, slant to this situation. And she just continued, just tongues just rolling out of her. She had no idea why until after the service was over and a group that had been standing over to the side came over to her and thanked her for, for preaching in Spanish. And she said, but I don't know Spanish. And they said, but you preached a wonderful message in Spanish and they were all convicted and began to pray and many of them received the Holy Ghost right there because God gave her a message that came to those people in their own language. She was traveling with a, they called it a band. In those days there weren't, I told you, there weren't churches like we have now and uh, a preacher would decide that he wanted to go to a certain part of the country and, and have some revivals and he would take a band with him. That meant there would be somebody that would help with the cooking because nobody was there to take care of them. And there would be somebody there that could play a guitar or a piano or something and somebody to sing and two or three to help pray for revival. Well, Maud joined one of these bands and they were having a hard time. They had to sleep on the floor and they were eating for several days nothing but flour gravy and cornbread. Now, I like cornbread and flour gravy, but I don't like them together. But that's all they had to eat, so they were eating it. And uh, the old pastor, the old preacher that was with him, his name was Brother Harvey. He was quite a praying man, and he prayed loud. And he prayed very direct to God. You know, let me just stop here and say, God is highly intelligent. And you, you can talk to him 
You don't have to get into a stained glass voice to make him hear you. You can just talk to him. And that's what Brother Harvey did. And so she heard him and he said, now God, we need some butter. And he said, God, we also need some honey. And she went to his wife and she said, I don't think Brother Harvey needs to be talking to God like that. And his wife said, honey, just wait. God will take care of it. They went to church that night and she knelt by the piano bench because she was the musician. And she was praying and somebody tapped her on the shoulder. It was a little girl. And she said, Mama churned today and we have a lot of extra butter. I brought it to you. Three pounds of butter. She began praying again and she got another tap on the shoulder. And there was a man said, I robbed the bees today and I had a tremendous amount of honey and I've brought you a whole gallon of honey. God has ways of building our own faith by she had heard that prayer and then she was the one that got the news that it had been answered. And I'll tell you one of my favorite family stories. My oldest sister who was 10 years older than I am, she and my other sister who was eight years older, they were, this was before I was born. And my dad was again trying to bring in another church, build a church. And they had run out of money and food just about. And Agnes, my sister, came in to mother. Mother was working in the house. And she said to, to my mother, she said, I'd like to have a, a bread and jelly sandwich. And mother had to tell her, she said, Agnes, honey, I'm sorry. We don't have any bread and I don't have any jelly. And I've heard my mother tell it many times. And she said she watched her. She turned around, walked out the door, went out to the old car, opened the back door and got in and made an altar out of that back seat. She prayed a few minutes, got out, went on her way as any child would do. She was back in the house with mother. Mother was, I think mother said she was sweeping or something. And she looked out the window and she said, there's a little girl coming down the lane and she's got a package under her arm. Agnes was standing there and she said, it's my bread and jelly. <laughs> the little girl walked up to the front door, knocked on the door. Mom went to the door. The little girl said, Sister Corin, my mother was praying a while ago and God spoke to her and said, send Sister Corin a loaf of bread and a jar of jelly. That happened in my family, folks. A child's prayer, and God heard it and provided. God is a God of miracles, and God is a God who hears you when you pray, and he is a God that answers your prayers. And one more story about Sister Maud. Is this okay? Are y'all okay? I love these stories. I love these stories. Sister Maud, that cute little thing, she was so cute. I'm telling you, you know, she was still living when my husband became superintendent. And she wore these cute little hats and she was just, she was just as cute as she could be. And she was the piano player for the revival that was going on with this band. And she said she was sitting at the mirror, at the dresser, trying to fix her hair and the preacher and some of the other people that were in, in the band, they passed the window and saw her and saw she wasn't ready to go. And they said, Maud, you're gonna be late. We've got to go on or we're gonna all be late. And she said, well, y'all go on and I'll catch up with you. So they did. But when they got to the revival place, Maud was sitting on the piano stool or the organ stool, whatever it was, playing. And they looked at each other and they knew she was at home when they left. So they go up to her and they say, Maud, you didn't pass us. How'd you get here? She said, well, I just don't know. She said, I finished putting the last pin in my hair and opened my eyes and I was sitting here on the stool, so I just started playing. (laughs) 
Do you know that happened in the book of Acts? People have been translated. God can do anything. And when you're serving him, he can come to your rescue, whether it's something big or something little. He is able and he cares for his people. And Sister Maud recorded many, many, many things that happened. And we have it all recorded at the campground. 1931 in Selma. Anybody know where Selma is? It's a little town somewhere in Louisiana. I don't know where it is. But they were having a revival there. And there was a man that got mad about something about the revival. The preacher's name was Brother Jesse King. I know the King family. I did not know him, but I know the, the King family. And this man said, I'm going to beat that preacher up. I'll make him sorry he ever came here. He comes in the back door and starts down the aisle goes on to the platform and draws his hand back to hit the preacher and his hand froze. He could not move it, it was frozen. And only when the saints prayed for him could he ever release his arm. That also happened to a missionary that I knew well in South America when they came to beat him up. They tried, but their hands froze. God can do anything. And you serve this God. And the same Holy Spirit that worked in these people is what is within you. But you know, if you don't know what a treasure you have, you don't know to believe for what God can do. That's why, especially for you people who've only had the Holy Ghost a short time, you need to know you serve a God of the impossible. You serve a God who cares. You serve a God who wants to bless you. You serve a God who has promised to take care of you. This same brother King, they came and threw acid on his back one time and it ate the shirt, holes all in the shirt, but not one spot of his skin was damaged. Can anybody say amen? amen. And then in 1967, I think it was, I'm not sure, but this is back to personal stories. God can protect even when you don't know what's going on. My husband was in the state of Maine preaching. Tommy and Terry were very young, just little kids, and we lived in a house that was in the edge of the woods. Back then, we didn't have cell phones. In fact, we hardly made long-distance calls. For one thing, they cost two or three dollars, and we didn't have the extra two or three dollars. So he came home from Maine, and he said to me, he said, what happened? to you or did anything happen to you on a certain night and he told me and told me about what time I said yeah I'll show you what happened I took him to the back door opened the door we had a pine thicket heavy heavy thicket of pines back there and it looked like somebody had taken a saw and just cut them off at the top I said there was a tornado came through did this damage to the trees on this side went over our house and did the same thing on the other side of the road. Because when he started to go to sleep that night, he said all of a sudden he saw in his mind me and the two kids, and we, he knew we were in danger. He said, I bolted up in the bed and started pleading the blood and asking God to protect you. And he did. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? What God can do, it's just absolutely amazing. And then for healing, my own daughter, and I'm not sure, she has preached in this church in years past, but for 10 years, 10 years, she was very sick. We didn't know whether she would live or die. It was a very strange virus that got in her body and went from one part of her body to the other. And sitting in a service one day, the preacher that was preaching didn't even know that, that it had finally settled in her liver. And her liver was six times its normal size. She was very sick. She was sitting there and walking across, he was just preaching and he, all of a sudden he stopped and pointed and said, God has just healed you. 
When he said that, she said, I turned deathly ill, very sick. And Steve, her husband, got up and took her to the room. We were in a hotel uh, gathering place. Took her to her room and she went to bed, very sick. But when she woke up the next morning, she was totally healed. She went back home to her own doctor and he had to say it was a miracle because that just does not happen with a liver. God is a healing God. He is able to do anything. You remember the story in the Bible? I'm almost through. Are y'all okay? You enjoying this? Is it good for you? You're getting a good dose of faith tonight. Uh, you read in the Bible, you remember the story of how the Red Sea parted and the children of Israel went through. And then when they came to Canaan, Jordan River was out of banks and it parted. They went through, everything was fine. Well, that didn't only happen in Bible times, but it happened in the Philippines. Anybody here ever heard of Billy Cole, Brother Billy Cole? Brother Billy Cole and Brother Adams were going up the mountain to to a place where they'd had great revival and they came to this stream that was out of banks and suddenly it opened and they just like the Red Sea or the Jordan River they went across with no problem came back from the meeting went back across and it flooded again that's modern miracles modern miracles. God is still a God of great miracles. And then this next one, it almost defies you believing. But I saw it with these eyes. These two eyes saw it myself. This happened in the Philippines too. They were having a great revival and there was a lot of opposition to it. And a group of men came into the meeting and just started firing their guns. And this little five-year-old, I believe she was five, but she was just a little girl. When it was all over with, her dress was riddled with bullet holes, but the child was perfectly safe. We have that dress in the archives in St. Louis, the dress that I saw myself with holes, bullet holes through them, but the child was not harmed. God is a God of great miracles, great miracles. And I'm coming to a close. But you know Sister Mangan, anybody know Sister Mangan? Well, when she was young preaching, they were preaching revivals. She called her dad or let him know, I don't know how it was. But anyway, she was very, very sick. And her father got in the car and drove over to where they were. It was in East Texas somewhere. And he said, Lane, we don't have time for you to be sick. We've got this revival going on. He laid hands on her, and she spit her tonsils out in her hand because it was the tonsils that was making her so sick. Now, that's somebody that lives in Alexandria that you know and has preached in this church. God still does those things that he's always done. I saw a lady in Rose Pine, you know, and this is not things that just happened all overseas. I saw a lady in Rose Pine on the front row of a, of a meeting we were having, and Brother Barnes prayed for healing for the people in the congregation. And a goiter that was this big just literally went down like you had punctured it with a pen and just was as smooth as it could be while we stood there and watched it. Is God exciting? Is God great? Is he able to do anything? He can do more than you ever thought he could do. Stories to tell your children. Stories to tell your children. Sit down, I got one more. <laughs> because this happened just two weeks ago. It still happens. It happened in the Philippines. They were having great revival. There was a group of young people 
like a bunch of these young people that had come in and had received the Holy Ghost. And their parents were not even Christians of any sort or kind. And they were very upset. And they went to the witch doctor. And this witch doctor had supposedly had power and it had happened before that he would go write his name, write the people's name down on a certain place and, and for them to die. And they had had these things happen. You know, the devil is real too. And so he went and wrote the missionaries' names down on this place where they did that, but nothing happened. And in the meantime, the young people couldn't go home because they wouldn't let them go home. And the local pastor did not have a lot of money, nor did they have a lot of food. But every day when they would cook, there would be enough to feed all of them. When there were, was very little food to begin with, but God supplied it miraculously. As a result, this witch doctor, when he was walking home from putting their names in this place, suddenly dropped dead. It made such an impact in the whole area that from then on, or it just happened, but the witch doctors started writing a prescription. When they couldn't do what somebody came then to, to, to do, they would say, you go see the UPC missionary because their God can heal, ours can't. <laughs> Two weeks ago that happened. Two weeks ago that happened. So let me just say this. You may be wondering why we don't see more of these things now. And I need to be sure that you understand this. God is able and he is still doing these things. But we live in a different age and time. When God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he miraculously did so many things. They had manna that fell on the ground that they could eat. They had quails that flew in that they could eat. They had a rock that followed them and out of it gushed water to take care of them. God did so many miracles because they were in a time of desperate need. In our modern day, we don't live in such need as people have at many times. And sometimes it doesn't help us I mean, it keeps us from having the faith for a lot of things that we do need. But let me just assure you this. If you ever get in a point where you really need, if you will use the name of Jesus, and if you will believe and pray, God is still in the miracle business. So we rejoice in the history, but we thank God because he is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever, he never changes. So don't forget to remember. God was always telling them, you remember those things. And if it hasn't happened to you, if you have a need, you can go to God and say, that old lady, Sister Tenny, told me that you did this back in those days, and I need you to do this today. And God is still the same God of miracles that he has always been. I think we owe God an applause. Would you stand with me? And let's praise him. Thank you, God, for all of your blessings. Thank you, God, for all of your blessings, for everything that you've ever done, for the miracles, because of your power, for your glory. And God is still able to do everything he has ever done, he can still do. Anybody here need a miracle tonight? Anybody here need a miracle tonight? Let's turn to our neighbor. If you've got your hand up, turn to them and lay your hand on them and pray. God, we don't know what they're praying for, but you know. We ask you in the name of Jesus. Pray with me, folks. Let's believe God for miracles to happen. Whatever is needed, Lord, we need your miracle work and power. We thank you for all you have ever done, and we're trusting you. Believe in you, Lord, that you will continue to do it. We have every way of right to believe it, Lord, that you have remained the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for every blessing and every good thing.
I love Jesus Christ. Do you love him? I thank God for his healing power. I thank God that he can provide. I thank God that he can protect. I thank God that he is able to do abundantly above all we could ask or think. Praise God. Pastor, hallelujah. Y'all enjoy stories to tell you. Amen. Let's give the Lord a great big hand.